Stories, the series exploring the culture, history, and traditions of the Ozarks. Storytelling has been a part of our culture from its beginning. Today I'll talk with storytellers and local historians about the art form. Support for A Sense of Place is provided by Silver Dollar City. They picked out the big pipe and they smoked the pipe. And after all that was done, they sat back rubbing their stomachs. According to historian Gordon McCann, storytelling is among the most important of all traditions of any culture because it allows traditions and customs to be passed down. Before people could write, history was passed down orally. Today, storytelling is more a form of entertainment. McCann says there are too many types of stories to list them all, but in the Ozark, stories consist of things like ghost stories, tall tales, or Wendy's as they're sometimes called, narratives, body tales, jokes, and anecdotes. And of course, this has always been a part of Ozark's life. This goes right along with the ballad singing and the fiddle tunes and the square dancing and the jig dancing and all that. This was a form of entertainment for people. Back in the days when families did things at home in the evenings after a hard day in the fields or communities uh, gathered on the front porch of the country store and all that. And this is one of the main things they did was exchange these stories. And you usually in a community, you had one, oh, I guess you'd say a primary storyteller, or one or two of those that were really good at telling these stories. And people would gather around them, and uh, in, in the family, there would usually be one person that was good at telling the stories. Jimmy Edwards works at the Ozark Folk Center in Arkansas, where characters from the Ozarks are brought to life through living histories, another form of storytelling. But he says traditionally, storytelling was a part of everyday life in the Ozarks. Years ago, in the early Ozarks, uh, stories were the way that we kept our family histories alive. Um, so it was a very important part. And if you stop and think, they didn't have TVs, they didn't have radios. So the way they would get together on uh, weekends or once a month or, or, at, or at cookouts or dances, they would sit down and they would tell everybody what had happened with your family. It was a way to get your family caught up or brought up on the, the history of your family and what your friends and neighbors were doing. Today, basically, we don't do that so much anymore uh, because we have televisions, we have telephones, we have the Internet and such. So today's storytellers are basically people that take uh, stories from the past, from the history, and recreate that history in today's uh, uh, language and such to kind of fill people in. While many stories told in the Ozarks are factual, there usually is some degree of embellishment, and it's up to the listener to determine what parts of the story are fact or fiction. If the storyteller is good enough, the listener may never know. For instance, Gordon McCann talks about the story of the hoop snake, supposedly a snake that, when startled, puts its tail in its mouth and rolls away. As the story goes, the reptile's tail contains a stinger with the strongest poison in the Ozarks. McCann says the story has been passed down for so long that people still believe such a snake exists. After telling the story on Ozark's Watch Video magazine recently, McCann received a call from a well-educated person who didn't doubt the existence of the snake but questioned the strength of the poison. That had been told in their family so many years, and this happens in communities too, that people hear these all their lives and they never question them. They never stop and think, well, now, could there really be a snake that does that? So you don't want to laugh at somebody when they tell you one of these, because they may really believe that, you know. At the Ozark Celebration Festival held recently on the SMSU campus, storytellers got the chance to practice their art under a tent near Hill Hall. I can get rid of that chicken hawk for you. But she said, really? He goes, yes, well, how are you going to do that? I'm going to kill him. John Hernandez began telling stories to keep his daughter entertained while they went out to eat. Hernandez, a member of the Moscoleta Indian tribe, says his stories are designed to teach people how to handle life's situations and how to be happy, how to reach a balance in one's life. He explains why it's important to keep the art of storytelling alive in the Ozarks. Because the great tradition here, a lot of the people here were oral people. Uh, they were in the rural areas. They didn't have a lot of schooling. So the art of telling stories was something they did not only at home to tell about their families, but also when the gatherings were together. The, they would, again, have morals and values in their stories. Uh, the Bible had a big deal to do that because people would tell stories about the Bible. So it's just not about customs. It's about religion. It's about spirituality. It's about healing. All those things you learn by telling stories. So, and it came especially from this area where we still tell stories. It's a great place. When y'all were, when you girls were kids, did you have beautiful dolls to play with? 
Laura didn't have a doll. Her older Shirley Johnson plays dulcimer at Silver Dollar City and tells an occasional story there. She began telling stories while teaching English classes to capture her students' attention. She explains why she continues to tell stories. I think it is vitally important. It's a big deal with me to maintain and to develop oral history. And I, I, I'm old enough that I, I was right on the cusp of the olden days, as it were, before electricity, before, uh, before things became so much easier for us, all the modern traditions. I was able to spend a few weeks every summer on my parent, um, grandparents' farm down in rural Kentucky. And being a city girl born and bred, it was a real eye-opener to see things done that way. And then just so quickly, it was all but gone. All that was left was the nostalgia because we were there. And then pretty soon that's going to be gone. And so I tell stories to help bring that to life. And there's always, always a good reason to listen to a good story because it tells you something about your life and about your, about your love and about your well-being. Johnson's stories are about real people, those who have made a mark on American history. Each storyteller has his or her own style and way of telling stories. Johnson incorporates her music into her storytelling sessions. The tiny village of Bradleyville hidden in the depths of the Missouri Ozark Hills near Branson, produced a basketball dynasty during the 1960s. Leon Combs recently began telling stories in hopes to do more in the future. His stories come from books he's written about growing up in Bradleyville. Combs hopes by telling stories, he'll help prevent a part of Ozark's history from becoming lost. I think that our, especially with the Ozark heritage, it was so rich and so strong, and of course it's growing so fast now with all the new communications. And uh, the kids in Bradleyville dress now like the kids in Cincinnati or, or New Jersey, and I think that, that, that even they now find the stories of hot pot bellied stoves and coon hunting, all those things are just you know, strange to them. So I think by storytelling, it's the old world's oldest way of passing along history. Gordon McCann has known many good Ozark storytellers over the years. Among those he lists as best are Dewey Short, J. Frank Short, Emmett Ragford Adams, and Bob Walsh, to mention a few. Although a few storytellers remain in the Ozarks, there are few traditional storytellers left. McCann describes traditional Ozark storytelling as fragile. Just the same as the ballads and the fiddling and uh, the square dancing and jig dancing and all that. Because the we're being mainstreamed and our, our interests are not as much uh, local anymore as they were at one time. Uh, the media's doing that. Television's, uh, oh, they'll never make us all the same, but uh, they're doing a pretty good job of, of people forgetting their traditions and this type thing, you know. Jimmy Edwards says it's important to keep the art of storytelling alive in the Ozarks because it's how we got to where we are. If you don't know where you've been, how can you know where you're going? Uh, how did you get to be the person you are? Everything that's involved, your grandparents, your parents, your brothers, sisters, all uh, made you who you are. You just didn't pop up out of the ground. So all of these experiences that have been brought along actually make us. So that's why it's probably important. To learn more about storytelling in the Ozarks, a good source is books by Vance Randolph. According to Gordon McCann, Randolph was the first person to document traditional Ozark stories. As a sense of place continues in the months ahead, we'll talk with a variety of people in the Ozarks to learn more about Ozarks culture, past, present, and future. Support for a sense of place is provided by Silver Dollar City. For KSMU, I'm Michelle Skaliski. Support for morning.